At the Endocrine Society meeting, I had the privilege of debating Dr. Andy Amen about whether or not people with type 1 diabetes should be taking SGLT2 inhibitors. Now, this is actually something I've done for a long time off-label because I know that it helps some of my patients with type 1 diabetes achieve better glycemic control. But I've also been very involved with discussions about the risk for DKA. So I was asked to present the con side of using SGLT2 inhibitors in people with type 1 diabetes, and Andy talked about why we should. I'm going to give Andy's side first. Basically, the reason to use SGLT2 inhibitors in people with type 1 diabetes is because they help people achieve better glycemic control. And it's not that their A1Cs go from 8 to 6. Really, what I see and what my patients have told me is that it helps reduce some of the unpredictability and some of the variability in their numbers, which helps reduce their diabetes distress and make them feel like it's somewhat easier to manage their diabetes. You do, on average, see something of an A1C reduction somewhere in the range of 0.3 to 0.6 percent. And you also see some weight loss, although it's not a lot of weight loss. It may be on the order of 1 to 3 kilograms. So obviously, there is a patient-driven desire to use these agents because it makes them feel better and it helps them manage their diabetes. But Andy talked about the real overarching reasons to use these agents, and that really has to do with their non-glycemic effects. So we know that SGLT2 inhibitors in people with type 2 diabetes, as well as in people without diabetes, has a marked benefit in terms of renal dysfunction. It helps patients with proteinuria slow down their progression to end-stage renal disease. We also know that these agents are very helpful in people with heart failure, and it helps prevent hospitalizations for heart failure in these vulnerable patients. So he would argue that you should use these agents in people with type 1 diabetes who have those high-risk characteristics. And frankly, if I have a patient with type 1 diabetes who has proteinuria, who is working with me in order to manage their disease, adding in an SGLT2 inhibitor makes a lot of sense in terms of helping them slow progression of their nephropathy. My side of the argument is, frankly, that I can't eliminate the risk for patients developing DK on these agents. And in every one of the clinical trials, there was an increased risk of DKA when treated with an SGLT2 inhibitor in people with type 1 diabetes in those on the treatment arm compared to those in the control group. So these drugs do increase the risk for DKA. Now, in Diabetes Spectrum, we recently published basically a listing of the different protocols that we all use, including me, for helping reduce the risk in our patients. But none of these protocols have been studied in a systematic way. And in the clinical trials, where they basically looked at the use of SGLT2 inhibitors in people with type 1 diabetes, their efforts to help mitigate this risk were variable and didn't actually seem to me to really do the right thing. It didn't provide enough patient education, enough practice doing ketone testing. There's a lot that I think we have to do in order to choose the right patients. Moreover, I am very worried that if these drugs are approved for the use in type 1 diabetes, that the wrong patients will be started on them, meaning the patients who are doing the worst, who aren't giving enough insulin, who may be ketotic at baseline. The use of these agents really needs to be reserved for patients who are testing their sugars, who are not ketotic at baseline, who have an A1C that, in my mind, is at least reasonably controlled, and I use a cutoff of 9%. But I really want a patient that's working with me, who I know I can teach to test their ketones if they need to. And also, patients must have access to medical care, because patients can develop euglycemic DKA, DKA with relatively normal glucose levels. And the way to get rid of the DKA, the ketones, is to have the patient give more insulin. But because often glucose levels aren't terribly high in these individuals, I have them consume carbohydrates so they can give more insulin, so they can get rid of the ketones, and obviously to consume fluids to get rid of the dehydration. But I really have to have patients that I work with closely 
in order to be able to feel safe using these agents, and particularly because they're off-label. In the end, I think Andy and I agreed. We agreed that there's a benefit for our patients with type 1 diabetes, to some degree a glycemic benefit, per perhaps moreover in terms of effects on nephropathy and heart failure, but those studies need to be done or we'll just have to extrapolate from studies in people with type 2 diabetes as well as those without diabetes. But I think we both agree that you can't completely eliminate the risk. It would be nice if some sort of protocol was studied in a prospective way to see how much risk reduction we can see in terms of this existing risk. And then hopefully at some point the FDA will feel comfortable at approving these agents in part because of the benefits I've discussed but also because if the FDA approves it, then there's going to be more regulation. There'll be more teaching. There'll be ways to get this, maybe coupling it with prescriptions from a pharmacy for ketone test strips. I don't know exactly what kind of monitoring we do if these drugs become available for people with type 1 diabetes, but I would hope that by approving this class of drugs for people with type 1 diabetes, that we'll be able to make it even safer to use them. And frankly, people are using them now. So why not make it something that's allowable and something that we can try to do as safely as possible? This has been Dr. Ann Peters from Medscape. Thank you.